Oh, the aborted um, Black Sabbath gig, or the aborted Ramones gig. They opened for Black Sabbath. That must have been... It was after Road to Ruin had come out. That would have been 79. 78, 79. Oh, fuck, don't know. It must have been 78 because... Rocket to Russia was the proof. So that must have been fall of 78. Well, the Ramones only got to play three songs, and I was pissed off about it. Tim and I stayed for Black Sabbath, and it was at the uh, con main concert hall in the Inland Empire. The, um, fuck, what was that place called? It's where I saw Alice Cooper, where I saw all kinds of bands. Bands had been playing there since Jimi Hendrix and Cream in the 60s. It was called, um, fuck. Anyway, that concert hall, after the show, Ozzy's limo was leaving, and I was kicking at the side of it, put a big old dent in it, because I had my big boots on, and uh, screaming, what, what happened with the Ramones? Why, why'd you guys let that happen? Anyway, that was, it was funny, and it was weird, because, what was weird about that, um, what was that place called, it starts with an S, um, <laughs> in um, 1981, a plane crashed into it, two weeks after Ozzy Osbourne had played there with his solo band, so that went, there went that concert hall and everything. So anyway, let me go to the next question. Okay, this oral history is taking up quite a bit of tape, Al. Uh, but anyway, uh, question number 11, is it 11 or 12, about Renee, the whole history? I met her at Riverside City College. She was wearing a cheap trick button. It was another big band I was into. Uh, First time she ever came over to my house. Um, it was my first apartment, and that was when I thought she was trying to pick up on me. And she was the first punk friend besides Tim that I had told I was gay. And she laughed and said, I don't care. I hate sex anyway. It's, you know, totally put all that to sleep. She ended up sp spending the night sleeping on my floor. From that period on, it started with Tim Shepard, myself, already sporting the name Drew Blood, Renee Gade. She was already known as Renee Gade and uh, Sue, Sue, we called Sue Catwoman, and from there, Donnie and Tud, and his friend Gary, who later went on to become um, in jo the bass player in Joan Jett's Black Hearts, and dated Lorna, married Lorna. By that time, I guess Donnie, Donnie and Gary had, had run away to L.A. Donnie must have been about 14, 13 or 14 then. And he had already made contacts with the whole L.A. scene. L.A. people were coming out to the squeeze to play. That was 1978, and it just quite naturally evolved from there you know, centered around the squeeze, around records, listening to records at any of our houses, partying together, drinking, um, smoking pot, occasionally LSD, but not very often. I kind of dropped out on that after 76, 77. Um, it just seemed a, a real natural progression 
um, playing, getting new records from Licorice Pizza, from their new so-called new wave section, um, going out there, you know, after my paychecks and shit, buying up records, uh, ha hanging with all of them. Brian Knox started coming into the scene then. Uh, Death Patrol started forming. Um, we were hanging out with the reactors, checking them out. Um, all of that took up all of 1979. It was the first heavy, heavy year of heavy all punk rock. And at the same time, all this emotional stuff was going on with me over Christopher. Um, all the way through the end of 79, um, going into LA, seeing bands, uh, Germs at the Fleetwood in February of 1980. December of 1979 was when Bill it was one of the times when Darby, I guess, had come out to, to Riverside to be with Donnie, because Donnie was, if he wasn't living in Hollywood, he was living at his mom's house, which was about halfway between my house and the Hoopa house. And uh, Bill had brought Donnie and Darby over to my house. That was the incident. Um, early, early, like around December 13th or something, because I already had a Christmas tree up or my first Christmas stick, I should say. Um, and Darby, I still had long hair because Darby wanted to cut it, but I wouldn't let him cut it unless he signed my Germs album, which I already had, and he wouldn't do that. Um, it was also about that time I got the Lexicon Devil single which Bill Bartell had quite a few copies of, and he gave me one. Because at the time, I just thought, you know, Lexicon Devil was like the punk rock song, and to me, it still is. It's like the epitome of the beginning of hardcore. Uh, and I'd already had the first single. Tim had the Yes LA album, but I didn't. I later conned him into giving it to me. <laughs> saying, oh, I'm going to die, I'm going to die, you should give me this. <laughs> so anyway, it was at the beginning of December 79 when I first had contact. I remember talking to Darby that October, that October of 79, I'd seen the Germs play at, was it Hong Kong Cafe, or Madam, it was Hong Kong Cafe, and that was when I first got my punk rock boot the big steel-toed engineer boots that everybody started wearing then. And Donnie was with me when I bought those. They were Georgia, Georgia engineer boots. It was also at that time we started going to the pleasure chest in Hollywood rather than Poser and getting bond, real bondage gear instead of, you know, fake punk rock Poser gear. And I guess it was the beginning of 1980 when I cut all my hair off and left a tail of the long hair on the back and started wearing red, green, and yellow roster rub color rubber bands, which led to my growing one big fat gnarly dreadlock from having, you know, washing my hair and everything and having all that hair and a tail in the back. So let's see the Germs played Fleetwood 79. Um, for 1980, uh, first, um, I, I had already done fucking bloody press, what was that, was that 78, maybe that was 78, or 79. I can't remember which. That was Fucking Bloody Press, which the title came from Fucking Bloody Mess and a Sex Pistols lyric. The second one was Potential H-Bomb, another uh, s s title stolen from a Sex Pistols lyric. When I first started using other people's work and 
Tim Shepard was the impetus behind that because he was doing his own little Xerox books. I had started writing poems for Christopher in 1978. So it must have been 78 or 79, I can't remember which. When I first started Drew Blood Cross Limited, but that's... But that idea was taken from Pill, so that had to have been after Pill's first album. I'd say 79 was my first. 78, 79 must have been my first chap, my first zine chapbook thing. Silence Drew Blood. That must have been spring 1980, or maybe it was fall 79, where I really started incorporating other people's ideas. And Bill Bartel had put out his super punk zine which I'd stolen some stuff from and I remember working on something about the germs breakup which was in the spring of 1980 and trying to get details from Bill Bartell about that I was going to write a whole article on that Don Bowles was already doing box pop on the side uh, Lorna was being Gary's girlfriend. I forget what Pat was doing, nothing probably. Darby had taken off for England, then come back in the summer. And by the summer of night by the end of the summer of nineteen eighty, Donnie was playing the Kings Adamant's Kings of the Wild Frontier and was Darby had given him feathers, he'd given him some souvenirs of uh from London, and Darby was sporting the mohawk and the boy of London bondage look, and start trying to start the Darby Crash Band, which uh, Donnie had went to go see. I remember two distinctive gigs, both of which I didn't bother to go see, one at the Starwood, one at the um, Whiskey. Um, Black Flag was starting to come out. I think I'd gotten their first single in either 79, I fall of 79 had gotten the first Black Flag single at the Licorice Pizza across from the Whiskey. Uh, we'd seen bands like Stiff Little Fingers, um, Black Flag, Circle Jerks first album was coming out. Gerber had married um, Gerber, who was also known as Michelle Bell. After she'd broken up with Donnie, she started going off with Rob Henley, who Darby also had a crush on. Skateboarding was really big that summer. There were slews of skate parks across Southern California. That's where that picture for the cover of the Circle Jerks album was taken at Gerber's and, and Rob Henley's wedding, the reception with all these people standing in the bowl of the skateboard bowl, like it was like an empty swimming pool type thing. These kids were, you know, skating in empty swimming pools then. And it was that summer, hardcore really started taking off. Summer of 1980. Um, I must have seen my first gig at the Cuckoo's Nest with the Weirdos and. Uh, and uh, the reactors had played, um, so while that was happening, I'd seen Black Flag at Blackies with the reactors. Um, I'd seen the Circle Jerks. Actually, we tried to go to a Circle Jerks show. It was right up when their album came out, but I guess the gig was canceled, and we ended up at um, Hong Kong Cafe or something. I think Fear was playing. Um, the germs were broken up. I think that fall was just a really weird time. Um, I think I saw The Clash for the third time play at the Hollywood Palladium. Second time I... No, that was the second time I saw him. Because the third time I saw him was after London Calling came out. And they played at the... Uh, 
class who played at Santa Monica Civic. So I saw the class twice at Hollywood Palladium first. And then, of course, that December was the Jones' last show. I remember getting the flyer from Donnie, like, a month before it. I remember that night, it was December 3rd, it was raining, 